our next speaker is James Benford. Jim, I think you're here. So we're moving from the uh, surface of a planet, surface of an Earth-like planet, to um, you know the, the near-Earth orbit and, and, and solar system cosmic backyard. Okay, I'm going to talk about a completely different sort of subject. I'm going to talk about artifacts, finding artifacts. Now, the, an, an extraterrestrial alien artifact is the ultimate techno signature. It's not about observing passive observation, it's about finding something. So it's, and I've explored that over the last few years in a series of papers, the first of which is, was called Looking for Lurkers, which described how one could search for the orbital objects around Earth, the nearest objects uh, uh, beyond the moon, uh, as a SETI observable. And two recent papers looks at how many alien probes could have come from stars passing close to the solar system, which is a surprisingly large number. And then finally, a Drake equation for alien artifacts, which argues that searching for artifacts is at least arguably comparable in probability of success to the standard SETI we have been doing for uh, over a half a century. The, um, the concept of the lurker, which is an old term in this uh, community, goes back half a century, it was introduced by Bracewell in this beautiful book of his. He said basically, if advanced civilization exists, they might come to look at us, uh, but I'm expanding that to say they would come to look at the ecosystem of Earth because that's very detectable in the atmosphere. Uh, we're very noticeable. And that such a robotic sentinel might establish contact or might not, but may or may not want to be seen or observed because of perhaps the zoo hypothesis or the prime directive or some other reason, which we do not know. Uh, and I want to point out which are uh, nearby objects would be most likely to contain, to, to have artifacts on them. The conclusion basically is the moon's the most likely the Earth Trojan is the next most likely, and the co-orbitals are the third, but they're all much nearer than the planets. So they're, they're or, or putting about at Neptune or something. So the idea, uh, let me introduce this by talking about how stars come very close to the solar system. This is not widely understood because the data is only very recent. Uh, uh, you get about two million, uh, about uh, uh, every 10,000 years, we get about two stars coming within 10 light years of Earth, some of them much closer eventually. Um, it could see an out of equilibrium atmosphere, the ETs could, and could send a probe over that relatively, uh, on a galactic scale, relatively short distance. Um, and so that argues that the CETA strat strategy which was a term which was introduced by uh, Robert uh, Frias uh, uh, 40 years ago, SETA would be a reasonable thing to do, especially since we now have much better space probes. The, um, uh, here's the history of the oxygen content of the Earth's atmosphere. Oxygen has been visible in the uh, uh, atmosphere of Earth for uh, uh, billions of years. And in the last two thirds of a billion years, it's been very high. As we know now, it's uh, 20, above 20%, and very visible over, over long, long distances. That, that is an out of equilibrium matter, which um, uh, uh, the chemistry of which was first pointed out by James Lovelock, who, by the way, is cel today celebrating his 101st birthday, remarkably. The, uh, remember that the Earth goes around the galaxy in a, in a, in a path about every 220 million years. So, if you look in the frame of, of Earth and the galaxies rotating, we are, we are a target. We're, we have stars flying past us, and the number of stars that come within a given distance goes as the square of the distance because it's essentially a two dimensional thing. Uh, here's the recent history of uh, uh, in the past and toward the, in, toward the future. Alpha Centauri is going to get quite a lot closer. And there are quite a few stars that are getting closer, and then we'll go further away. Recent analysis of the Gaia data, uh, uh, well, I'll get to that in a moment. A little known fact is that Solstice star came very close, 0.8 light years to Earth within the Oort cloud 70,000 years ago, and probably disturbed the outer layers of the Oort cloud, 
producing comets which will fall toward the center of the system where we are, uh, arriving in three million years. So don't don't wait up for it. The um, uh, here's a uh, the analysis of the Gaia data shows the the perihelion distance versus time of two of 694 stars, showing that they come to very come very close. Some of them come very close. And some of them have come very close in the recent past, and let's say in the last few million years, and have now moved away. I wanted to point out to our SETI colleagues that looking at those stars that have recently passed by would be a nice, uh, interesting observation technique, uh, a, a, a selection to look at, because they might be transmitting to us, having sent a probe here already and known that there's life here, they might be just occasionally sending a message to see if we had those primates they saw a million years ago had evolved into anything. So uh, there's an analysis in the papers that uh, gives the numbers and, and calculations. I'm not going to dwell on that. I don't have time. Uh, but the key equation is that the number of lurkers uh, that would be nearby on uh, one of these locations, such as the uh, moon, uh, depends upon the fraction of, of uh, F, F sub IP, the fraction of, uh, of civilizations that would send interstellar probes times the time uh, uh, that a, a lurker would reside on the object it landed on, which could be very long time, times the arrival rate of stars. Uh, and then the papers can an analysis that, that gives a probability for each of the major types of objects we might investigate, like the moon, the co-orbitals, and the Trojans. Uh, the first place you'd look would be the moon. Why? It's been there forever, uh, in our terms. It, we have about two million photographs from the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, down to resolution in some places of a foot. As you can see here, you can see uh, the you can see uh, uh, the footprints of um, and tire tracks uh, uh, of the uh, Apollo explorers uh, quite easily and some of them in great detail. Uh, and so we have that over most of the moon and it's increasing steadily. And most of these photographs have never been looked at, never been examined. So we will need an AI uh, to uh, separate it out. Now, Angerhausen has a paper on the site that you can read about this, a presentation he did not give uh, but he's developed an AI which can tell a, a standard lunar photograph to an Apollo area for photograph and identify the, the uh, artificial features of it and do it automatically. We should fund uh, a, a look at all those uh, photographs if we're going to really look for artifacts on the surface of the moon, which I think is the most likely location. Now, we all know where Lagrange, Lagrange points are. This is the Sun-Earth Lagrange configuration and recently was discovered was uh, the first of the Earth Trojans at L4. Uh, they're estimated to be several hundred on the scale of a kilometer, but they're very hard to see. But we should be looking, uh, this would be a very good observation point to look at the Earth because they're in a fixed relationship with each other. For example, here is the Earth Trojan 2010 TK7, and it lopes, uh, it, moves above and below the, the uh, plane of the ecliptic uh, and staying at varying distance from us, but it could be looking at us for over the long term. It's a good place to look from. Even closer, much closer in fact, are the co-orbitals, which are, uh, uh, and I should say the Earth Trojan only recently discovered the co-orbitals more recent than that. There are about 15 to 20 co-orbitals. They have three kinds of orbits. There's the tadpole and the horseshoe, which can, uh, an object can move from one of those to the, uh, to the other, back and forth. They come close to Earth uh, uh, every year, uh, go back around the uh, orbit, and come back again a year later, on, usually typically on the other side, uh, in the case of the horseshoe, on the other side of Earth, following or, or ahead of. Uh, and these are co-orbital because they have the same year, they're at the same distance from the sun, and they are in uh, fairly stable orbits over periods of millions of years. The most interesting of these are the quasi-satellites, which look to us like 
um, second, third, and fourth moons. In fact, they, when originally discovered, they were called that, the second and third moon of Earth, because they are, are much closer. Here, for example, is the closest of them. The 2016 HO3, which was discovered four years ago, appears to uh, orbit around the Earth uh, at a distance uh, that's really quite close. Look down at the bottom of this, of this slide. You see the Earth on the left, and this is to scale, the Earth and the Moon, and then 2016 HO3, it's its closest approach. There's a typo in the number. It's actually 2.6 million year light, uh, 2.6 million my, uh, kilometers away at its closest approach. So it's much closer than a Trojan and far, far closer than a planet or any of the asteroids for sure. This is a very interesting target. And this would be the first place I would go to look beyond the moon because it's got an orbital stability time of perhaps, uh, well, several million years. And any lurker uh, on that uh, would, that arrived say 100,000 years ago would still be there. That's the key point is the longevity of, of probes that would look at Earth. These lurkers could be there long after they lost their functionality but still be discoverable by us if we go exploring. The Chinese, by the way, plan to launch a probe to 2016 HO3 uh, in about five years. So they're way out ahead of us in, in exploring these areas. We have no plans to explore the orbitals or the Earth Trojan. Uh, in the paper on the Drake equation, what I decided to do was to write a Drake equation for SETI and SIS, SETA. Now, SETI is the well-known Drake equation, but if you do take the ratio of the two, all those things about the number of stars and planets and all that sort of thing, all of those terms cancel out. Those are the terms on the left of the uh, side, uh, on the right side of the equation, the thing in brackets is all the things that are in common because all that is what it takes to generate a civilization. Then after that are the fa factors that have to do with the specific strategies we could follow to find ET. And so you see, it comes down to sim two simple ratios. The first ratio is uh, the fraction of, of uh, 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 civilizations that would send probes uh, to the fraction that would radiate to Earth. I would argue that that fraction is, this fat ratio is on the order of one or a tenth or so. After all, we could build beacons right now, interstellar beacons if we wanted to. Within a century or two, we will be able to send probes to the nearby stars. In fact, Starshot, the project which I work on, uh, is planning to send flyby probes by start launching in 2050. Now, the next ratio is the key thing. What is the time that a lurker would still be there for us to find, divided by the time over which a civilization would radiate toward us? Well, I would argue that this ratio is very large because a lurker could be there for millions of years or hundreds of millions of years on the moon or even a billion on the moon. Whereas radiating times are certainly not going to be like that. They would probably, uh, the time a lurker could be uh, residing on a nearby object, these nearby objects would be uh, probably longer than the lifetime of a civilization. And therefore this, this ratio is much greater than one. Therefore, it were likely to be more successful looking for uh, artifacts than listening to the stars. So I advocate to find alien artifacts, we do the, fel the following. First, develop an AI for looking at the LRO uh, photos. Um, then conduct passive SETI observations. So this is one way that SETI can get into the game because we've already got observing time in a breakthrough listen. Uh, listen to these uh, near Earth objects, which as far as I know has never been done, uh, in the microwave, the infrared and the optical. Do some imaging. There are no images of the co-orbitals, no images of the uh, Trojan, because the astro astronomers who study these objects are interested in their orbits, not their identity, not their, that's what they look like. And then we could use active planetary radar to uh, ping them and get an image. A couple of the co-orbitals are within radar range. Uh, at their closest approach. And then we could do the more advanced and, and adventuresome thing, conduct active simulus, simultaneous radar painting while listening uh, to uh, see whether there is any response. 
Uh, you could do that in the optical as well. Finally, one would try to launch robotic probes such as uh, CubeSats to photograph or and eventually take samples of the co-orbitals and the Earth Trojans to first of all, do good astronomy. We don't know anything about them really, just that they have low albedo. And the, uh, uh, the, the, that good astronomy would also allow us to look to see if there's anything artificial there, much closer than anything else we can explore. So the, the success ratio that I showed you means that searching for artifacts compared to listening to the stars, which we've been doing for a half a century, allows us to quantitatively evaluate the relative merits of these two strategies. There's a lot about it in the paper. I have not time to go over it. I think that they are competitive strategies, and yet the CETA proposal has never been pursued in the 40 years since it was proposed by many, uh, and by Jacob, for example, who has written a paper about why this is a good idea. Uh, and finally, the analysis I put in the I reached in the papers is that the moon and their Trojans have a greater probability of success, but on the other hand, the co-orbitals are much closer. So what's the cost and what's the benefit? This is the final slide. It takes time on telescopes. It costs, it takes revenue. Uh, it takes personnel. But they co the costs start small. You, looking at the LRO photos is not a big expensive thing. But they grow over time, so we need, a, I think, a separate program to pursue this active matter. What do we gain? We'll be looking for something. We'll be doing a new thing, a new kind of exploration. We know nothing about these, so we're going to gain astronomy. But more than that, we do something new, something active, not passive. Remember, SETI is a passive activity. This is active. This is exploring. This is looking for things. This takes a different mindset from the SETI mindset set, uh, and it takes a different set of skill set as well. We need to have, I think, a different departure, a CETA program separate from the SETI program, although the two can be linked in their early phases, is, is a fresh front in SETI research. That's the end of the talk.